الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل الطاهرين It's a pleasure to be uh, sharing the next few days in the presence of you dear sisters and uh, you've kindly assigned a few titles for me and I'll do my best to uh, speak within my capacity in relation to them. In this first lecture, the title given was in relation to the current events in the uh, occupied lands of Palestine and what our duty is. And so I want to start off by trying to explain that when in Islam this talk of duty, when this talk of what is your duty, I want to open up what the philosophy of this question is and why it's important. So whenever this talk of duty, there's something underlying it and then we'll come to present day events and we'll speak about it inshallah. The first point is that the essence of what I am, of what you are, what is the essence of any human being? It can't be material. Our essence can't be something material. Because being material, by definition, by definition, is being in a state of potentiality. And that's why everything you see around you, which is physical, which is material, it's always in a state of becoming, and then ending, and then becoming. So for example, an apple seed is in the process of becoming, it becomes a tree, an apple, then it decomposes and then something else starts. But whatever is potential, material, whatever is physical, by definition, it's always in a state of change and transition, or in philosophical terms, from potentiality to actuality, to potentiality again, actuality, everything material follows this. And that's why we call physical things material. Its root lies in this being potential. But the essence of what me and you are, that doesn't be and then end and then be again and then end. It always is. We are eternal beings. Our essence has to be something non-physical or immaterial. And it starts at a particular point of time, which in the Sharia they call it ensoulment, which is around four lunar months in the mother's womb. But whenever the first traces of immateriality starts, the I starts. You begin. Whenever the first traces of immateriality start, yes. I'm sorry to start off with this philosophical discussion, but it's worth it as we progress, inshallah. And the sense perceptions that we have, the perceptions of our sense faculties, they are all immaterial. Your dreams are all immaterial. They're not physical things. And the difference between, or a, an important difference between something which is immaterial and something which is material, is that the material thing will end, has a beginning and has an end. Anything material, sooner or later, it ends, decomposes. But an immaterial thing, once established, because it's not limited, by the material parameters of time and space, immaterial things persist forever. 
they never go. Once established, it will never cease to exist. So, immateriality after immateriality, perception after perception, your thoughts, your intentions, all these are immaterial. These are, these are you. This is the very fabric of who you are, this immaterial reality. How you think, how you perceive. Most important of all, what your intentions are. Because actions and knowledge are a function of your intentions. And intentions too are immaterial truths. And whenever that first sense perception starts, you start. And as you grow, the degree of immateriality will be more and more enhanced. But the essence of what you are, you are your knowledge. You are your immateriality. You are your intentions. That's the very fabric of what you are. And moment to moment, you are adding to this immateriality, which establishes your essence. Intention after intention, thought after thought, action after action, you are building that immaterial essence of who you are. And they will never leave you. It will never leave you. Sins or immaterial intentions at play, it will never leave you. Good deeds will never leave you. Even if you were to repent, the sins will be covered, but it will never leave you. You are your actions. So this is the reality of who we are. And moment to moment we're building upon it. We're establishing it, constituting it, depending on how we intend, what our intentions are moment to moment. Now, so, even the actions that we do, these are physical actions that we do, the actions aren't important, they're secondary. It depends on what the intentions behind the actions were. That's immaterial. Doing a lot of salat, a lot of fasting, going to hajj a lot, in itself, we don't know if it's good or bad. In itself, we need more details. If it's done with non-sincere intentions, that salat will be limited. It's a physical action. If it's done with bad intentions, God forbid, like out of Riyadh, that salat is causing an immateriality, re immaterial reality within you, which is evil, which is bad. And that evil nature of yours will manifest before you when you die. And it's going to be ugly what you see. But it was you. Punishment doesn't come from outside you. It's a result of you. What you built moment to moment. This immaterial truth of yours. You may go to Hajj every year. But if it's not done with the right intentions, at least the minimum right intentions. Intentions too. There are degrees to intentions. Some people may want to go to Hajj because they want to be forgiven. Some people want to go to Hajj because they want to go to heaven. It's okay. Some people want to go to Hajj for Allah's sake alone. Look, there are different degrees of intending. But the actions alone doesn't mean anything. Actions only have value after we solve what the intentions underlying them are. Otherwise, God forbid, a kafir, a monafir, can do the external actions of salat, for example. It's not a difficult thing to do. Even a four-year-old can show you what the external actions of salat are. So for now, 
as a result of the essence of what we are, which is something immaterial, our thoughts, our perceptions, and primarily our intentions make up what we are. Now we have ahwadith, where someone asks Imam Sadiq that why do those who go to heaven go to heaven forever? Or why do those who go to hell go to hell forever? Why not for a period of time? The Imam answered in this manner and said, at the end he said, it all depends on your intentions. If the status quo of your immaterial soul, the essence of what you are and what you've intended, is so bad that were you to live on earth forever, you would always sin. Look, so there's a reality here. It's an evil intended soul. And that degree of that bad intentioned soul is so bad, but it, it's something real. They've acquired this badness, and it's present before them, right now, whilst they're living. But it was so bad that when they die, they will go to hell forever. Because if they were to live forever on earth, they would continue sinning. The same with, they were so good, their intentions were so pure. If they were to live forever, they would always submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obey Allah. And then there are people like me and you who do a bit of both and we'll have a bit of both. And ultimately heaven is our due. But at the end he said, it all depends on your intentions. See, heaven and hell is a function of your intentions. The hereafter is a function of your intentions. Any talk of knowledge and action, it's a function of your intentions. So this is something very crucial here, that you are your intentions. That is the reality of what you are and persist to be in the hereafter. Now, the question is, what are your intentions with respect to apartheid, genocide, terrorism, usurpation, usurping land, settler colonies, which by its very nature is violent, racism, and something which covers and embraces all, Zionism. All these are forms of oppression. Now, what are you intending? What are your intentions when you see or are surrounded by these acts of oppression. So, when we say what is our duty, the more crucial and underlying question, which is a precursor to what is our duty, is what must we intend? Irrespective of whether our actions become actualized or not, that which has primary importance and is, has priority hierarchy-wise is what are you intending? And when in the face of all these ills, moment to moment, how you intend, you're building yourself. Now, unfortunately, it's not as easy as you may think. Intending doesn't mean just an academic acknowledgement or just a brain exercise and then you say um, Zionism is bad settler colonies is bad apartheid is bad is that it? Is, we just say that game over we become good people of course not because a kafir can say apartheid is bad settler colonies are bad Zionism is bad. Look, but we're Muslim. We're not humanitarians. A kafir can be a humanitarian at best, but humanitarianism is a very small thing. It's 
Islam is something else. So, what should we intend in the face of all these ills? It's not an exercise of one's rationality or just thinking about something and acknowledging it. That's not intending. And the reason it's not intending, because intending doesn't come from the brain. It comes from deep within. It comes from the soul. The soul intends. And therefore, right now, depending on the status of your soul, we can, you, you can evaluate what you're intending. It's a very delicate point. I'm trying to open this up to some degree. So, here, sometimes intentions have to be, or the intentions have to be Allah-based, Tawhidi-driven. One must intend Allah fully. And that means Allah must be intended as a general principle in our lives. And that's what Ittaqullah means. I'll come to that later too. When anything minus Allah is intended, that is void. When you intend something minus Allah, when you intend something Allah-lessly, you're creating a void within yourself. And that will harm you in the hereafter. Even animals have a higher status than that. So the question is, where is Allah intended? You're saying that intentions have to be Allahfully made. They have to be Tawhidi driven. Allah has to be intended. Where is Allah intended? In the heart, in the soul. And to the degree that Tawhid has been incorporated within your soul, in proportion to that, you can intend properly. If there's no Tawhid, or be you a Muslim, if there's no Tawheed incorporated into your heart, you can't intend unlawfully. You may say genocide is bad, but it, that's, you're still on a par with a kafir. Because they can say that too. The statement genocide is bad has only value when it comes out from a heart that has absorbed a degree of Tawheed the more the better. I'll give examples in a minute. I'm just giving the principles for now. With one example, inshallah, it'll be easy to digest. So, to the degree you're a monotheist in real terms, and Allah has been incorporated within the heart to different degrees, only then you can intend properly. So, if I give charity, for example, but with this status quo of the soul that I believe wholeheartedly it's entered my heart that all wealth is Allah's one. With yaqeen, it's entered my heart. <coughs> Nothing is mine with yaqeen, it's entered my heart. All is his with yaqeen, it's entered my heart. I follow only his order, no one else's. It's entered my heart. I want to please him alone. That's entered my heart. That charity has value. A kafir can't do that because there's no toheed. He doesn't say all wealth is Allah's. Look, just because he gives charity, that in itself is neither here nor there. It's the intentions behind it which builds them and they remain a kafir. They may get some benefit in this dunya, in the hereafter they're empty. 
So a kafir will give charity with this status quo of their mind or soul. That I earned it. Look, at the very beginning, they believe they earned it. It's mine, my house. Look, even Muslims may fall into this. When I say kafir, I don't mean the kafir that we refer to in the Sharia. Kafir means you're hiding something. Many Muslims are kafir. They're hiding from the truth. They're hidden from the truth. I earned it. It's mine. I say it's good to give. I get upset if I lose it. A true Muslim will never, one who believes all is Allah's, all wealth is Allah's, will never get upset if they steal some money from him. They'll do their best to get justice and fight for justice. That is their duty, but they won't get upset in the process. They do what their duty is, intentions. And so with the kafir, with such intentions, when they give charity, the intentions is that of the dunya. That's it. It's all dunya. We don't want that level of intentions. And humanitarianism, humanitarianism which I'm surprised many Muslims are always mentioning this. What's happening in Palestine, they say it's a humanitarian massacre. It, it is, but it's much more than that. Some people are only, they want to address the world. They're a Muslim, monotheist. But when they want to address these problems, they always approach it from the angle of humanitarianism. That's limiting Islam. It's not Islam. What you're doing is just enhancing the dunya. It's not helping anyone. Okay, now, let's go back to those ills. Genocide, apartheid, Zionism, terrorism, settler colonies, occupation, usurping of land. The question now, deep down, we have to ask ourselves, because it may be polluting or it may be illuminating, depending on what the, what the answers are, in the face of all these ills, what are you intending right now? What are your intentions right now? Someone may say, look, this is something you can't academically just make up. What is the status quo of your soul? What is it intending right now? Not what you're just rationally thinking and just say it. Because the soul, you can't lie. Some people, they're not intending anything. And they're just living their lives just like before all these atrocities. So they have no intentions. It's neither here nor there. They're just like animals, if not worse. Moment to moment, they're becoming more and more animal-like. Because they're not intending anything in the face of all these ills. Now, intending has degrees, but they have nothing. Okay, these people may be very little. Inshallah, there are no, no one like that. But still, it's a possibility. Then, if you're intending nothing, well, let's avoid. If you're intending something, okay, what is it? Are you satisfied with what's happening? Or are you dissatisfied with what's happening? Now, everyone says we're, sati we're, we're dissatisfied with what's happening. That's a rational brain exercise there. I, I'm not interested in what your brain says. Because the brain, you can use the brain to lie. I want to know what your heart says. Not as a judge or anything, everyone to their own. They have to deep introspect within. Am I satisfied with what's going on? Or am I dissatisfied? Some people may be feeling very dissatisfied, but they're not acting too much. Some people may be feeling very dissatisfied, and they're acting every day. 
But this feeling of dissatisfaction and the acting, where does it emanate from? It has to be Allah fully. Without incorporating Allah in your heart, you can't intend anything Allah fully. You can only intend Allah fully on a par with how much Allah resides in your heart. And so, that feeling of negativity that you have, dissatisfaction, and the actions that you do, and there are many movements and organizations, commissions, missions, and all these things which they have protests, demonstrations, and everything, but are they all Allah fully? Look, I say, even if it's not Allah fully, have protests and demonstrations. But that, that's a minimum. But we want to grow in the process. Don't suffice with the minimum, because on a minimum, you're sharing the same platform as a humanitarian, as a kafir. We have to grow much more. So any protests, any demonstrations, or any other activities, which I'll list a few in a minute, they have to all stem from Tawheed. Otherwise, you won't be growing in the process. So, this being dissatisfied, you have to show it. What are you doing? Is it done unlawfully or unlawlessly? Are you doing anything which is helping these crimes in taking place? Those who are living in the UK, it's a very sad state of affairs right now. Their taxes are participating in the bloodshed of the Palestinians, without a doubt. When, when Sunak, the Prime Minister, comes to the occupied land with a jet military plane with all the ammunition and means in that plane and he exits from the back where the ammunition are delivered then he says there are not two sides to this there's only one side and that's Israel what on earth are the Muslims doing in England? what are they doing there? I'm not saying they have to all leave that's one option migrating away from there but they have to compensate in the hell which they're residing in. Moment to moment, they're in hell. Whether they can make that a heaven, <coughs> heaven and hell, function of one's intentions, it depends on how much they're compensating. Not compensating like a humanitarian, not compensating like a kafir, compensating as a Muslim, a monotheist. And I've spoken about this elsewhere in detail, I don't want to divert too much. And then, so, and then in the Quran, with the help of the Ahlul Bayt, with verse of the Holy Quran, there are verses which show that any form of satisfaction or aid from the heart, satisfaction or aid to any such crimes, when there's satisfaction within the soul, not the brain, when there's help emanating from the soul, you're a partner in crime. Just like the Zionist. Why? Why do I say just like? Because he's, the Zionist is killing people. You're sitting here in a room, but the status quo of the soul is the same. And the hereafter is a function of the soul. There's no difference between the two people. In the hereafter, your partners in crime. Now, the verse in chapter two, verse hundred and chapter three, verse hundred and eighty-three. In the middle, it says to Allah says to the Holy Prophet, tell them, it's in relation to the Jews that there was a debate about previous prophets. All the Holy say, O oh, Prophet, tell them that uh, prophets before me uh, came to you with clear signs and with that which you speak of. Oh, they've come to you. 
This is the time of the Prophet addressing Jews. It doesn't have to be Jews though, it can be anyone today. Why did you kill them, those prophets, in Kuntum Sadiqi, if you are truthful? But those Jews at the time of the Prophet, they weren't living with those prophets who were killed before the Prophet, the Holy Messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were living right now. They weren't living at the same time as those Jews, for example, living in the time of Musa salam. But the Prophet said, so why are you killing the Prophets? Why? Because the status quo is the same. Of the Jew addressed by the Holy Messenger and the Jew that killed the Prophets, the status quo is the same. Your partners in crime. It's a very delicate verse. And here, even in Saqifa, this there are many traditions which the same rationale can be used, but I don't want to might divert right now. So, a few actions that one can do or think about. These are just my personal opinions. It's not something I'm saying everyone has to do. I'm not from Tanzania. I don't know the culture here very well. I don't know the political system very well. What I'm saying now, it may apply, it may not apply. You have to forgive me, but at least let me just speak my mind. One is protests and demonstrations, especially outside the embassies of America and Israel, especially in crowded areas, especially where in areas where the natives are more susceptible to come to you and listen to you. Now you may say, oh, that's not possible. The government doesn't allow it. And that's unfortunate. If that's the case, it's unfortunate. Especially with the history of Tanzania and its previous presidents and their idea in relation to Zionism. If that's the case now, this the community is failing, not the community, the Ummah in Tanzania is failing. Why did it evolve? It was very anti-Zionism once upon a time. What happened in the last 50 years? But I would still attend protests or demonstrations to the best of my capacity. They may take you in, imprison you, but you've served Allah by giving the truth out to the people, even if you're 10 people. You can't make the government with evil intentions comfortable. You have to do something. But being silent here is problematic. So that's one thing. The next is clothing at the workplace, at university, at school. Things which show your sharing with the pain and sharing the solidarity with the Palestinians, it can be a badge, it may be any form of clothing, the flag, these, it doesn't matter, you're just wearing it. They can't stop you from wearing even the hijab, for example, with that kind of emblem would be a good thing. Sponsoring media specialists journalists who you know are good people, sponsoring them so that they can report more. Even here in Tanzania, helping them in this regard may be useful. Boycotting things is always very good. Now, some may say, you boycott, we have to boycott Pepsi. Other one says we have to boycott, let's say, another um, uh, company or whatever. Here, if if one of them believes this is Zionism and the other one doesn't, it's okay, don't argue about it. Everyone to their own. There's no need to judge one another. When you believe a company is supporting Zionism, boycott their goods to the best of your capacity. Yes. Disassociate, disassociate from political parties. Voting, if this is going to continue, here you have to think twice about voting. 
and getting close with the governing uh, parties here, when you get close with them, sometimes you get close with them for the best interests of your race or your community, be they Muslim or not. But you have to be careful when you do this, it shouldn't be at the detriment of the best interests of Islam. Sometimes you see on the media, footballers or actors, they compromise their jobs by speaking out against the atrocities against the Palestinians. Everyone to their own, whatever your job is. Look, even some of them may not be Muslim, but they lose their jobs. And the jobs which are very high earning, with high incomes. Petitions are always useful, and therefore being active, going from door to door with the natives, you know, from a root level, collecting these petitions. Um, contact the youth, especially if they contact and have contact with the youth of other countries in solidarity with the Palestinians. Supporting certain organizations may be okay, but some organizations are just, at best, they're suspicious. For example, there was one um, organization called Palestine for Action or Action for Palestine. And they're non-Muslim. And they say we go, they're based in the UK, they go to places or warehouses where Israeli warplanes are being built or the technology is being built, and they go and do certain things to the buildings and try to prevent them. They're non-Muslim, but they don't allow Muslims to join them. That's a question mark there. If you're going out and doing it, why don't you let Muslims do it with you? It's suspicious. Giving money to such organizations, you have to think where, who you want to support. Just because an organization has Palestine in it, it doesn't mean it's a pure organization. And uh, the data which I've just given in relation to this one was something years ago when I was in Los Angeles. The youth there, they investigated this organization. They didn't come with, with very positive findings. They had dialogue with them. Even the late Muhammad Azamun, who passed away recently he, um, at 34 years of age, he was from LA. Yes, he was very active then. And he would have a lot of dialogue with Palestine for Action, but what he would come to me with, with the data, was all suspicious. So you have to be careful of where you give it. And finally, well, not finally, there may be one or two other points, yes. Silence before these atrocities. Is it always bad? Or do we have a good form of silence? Look, this is a delicate question. We can't just say whoever is silent, we can't say they're bad, therefore. Yes, there is a form of silence on a par with pacifism that will be polluting your soul. But are all forms of silence in the face of atrocities, are they regarded bad? And we are followers of Ahlul Bayt. We have the Askari model, Imam Hassan al-Askari, alayhi salam. Six years he was under, his imamat took, six, uh, took over six years, just around six years. So he was the Khalifa of Allah for six years, which was is the shortest time, if I can remember correctly, of any Imam. He was taken into prison 11 times, and he was in house arrest most of his life. Look. With all the atrocities occurring around him by Bani Abbas, or the Abbasids as they call them, you don't see one word coming from Imam Askari's mouth against the tyrannical ruling parties at the time. Nothing. That's silence. 
But you can't say it's bad. Why? Because there was a lot of dynamicity behind this silence. Now I've given lectures on this elsewhere. I don't want to go into this too much. But the strategies he incorporated, practical, active, which all went against the ruling parties. But he never spoke a word against it. Sometimes that may be required in certain countries. I don't deny that. But you can't just use that as a loophole or just a cop-out, so to speak. But he was under house arrest, under the most strictest of surveillances possible. He never married. He never had a nikah marriage. Narjis Khatun, it wasn't through a nikah. It was through what their right hands possess. She was a slave. With slaves, it's another agreement. It's not the formal nikah of the Sharia. No one could enter his house. Whoever enters or exits, they were monitored. You couldn't just go there and ask now a marriage for a marriage to happen. It was that severe. But with the slaves, they weren't surveying them as much. And once they got to know about a child that was born, they took Najus Khatun to the palace of the Khalifa and she died until the end of her life without seeing the Imam. But such an individual Imam, Ma'soom alayhi salam, he was silent. But he was active in many different areas, all with the intention of crippling the Abbasi regime of the time. But that's a historical discussion, another time, but I have spoken about it. And so silence, maybe it's possible, maybe some people are doing things. But as I say, we have to do our best to be as active as possible. To be silent and active is so difficult that it's as if it may be confined only to the Ma'asumi. It's not an easy job. It requires things where not an ordinary person may not be able to do it. But I don't want to say it's impossible. Okay, let me see if there's anything else. Okay, no, I think I'll stop there. There's just one or two other points, but I think it's, we're reaching the end of time too. Okay.